We will begin in a minute. We will begin in a minute. Good morning, everyone. Let's try that again. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right. <laughs> Buenos dias, senor. Welcome to day six of our uh, Feast of Tabernacles. I guess you guys are still full from last night, huh? Yes. <laughs> that was some lovely food. Thank you. Um, again, today we'll begin with our uh, um, theme song. Sister Celia and company, Sister Ada, Sister Melissa, Sister Rose. <laughs> Sister Melissa is still full. <laughs> um, Brother Mark, our theme song. <laughs> Stop laughing at us. Oh, that 
You may be seated. Amen. Rejoice in the Lord always. Let's keep the rejoicing going, brothers and sisters. At this time, we'll have our announcements by Deacon Carnegie. Oh, he was here just a minute ago. Let me just open the door and see if he's right here. Oh. Should be right there. If not, we're going to ask Brother Mark. Oh, he's right here. I will. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, that's not so bad. It's not like you all had a good night rest. And I was just outdoors, just rounding up folks who are staying until Sunday just to verify that everything works out for them. So, just want to remind everyone that we, you all have a nice afternoon today. Picnic recreation, if you will. And I uh, uh, show, uh, I'm sure Rosemary is going to come talk about it after services to uh, fill you in all the uh, small details, major details, if there's any. And um, trustfully, uh, and I know it will, that everyone will have a good time. And uh, we know the forecast is calling for splendid day and afternoon and that makes it even better okay and um i just want to also uh you know just remind uh everyone that if there's anyone among us and anyone that you know that's here in need of prayers to let us know certainly approach myself or mark and let us know and we will uh, go on from there okay <laughs> Okay, and um, the um, event yesterday, for that matter, I, I, can't, I can't say enough. It was wonderful. And, um, oh, I'll give him a chance to uh, play catch up. Okay, not sure how many people may have missed the food portion of it yesterday, but uh, everything went well. We had a wonderful time at it, and um, it couldn't have been better. Conversations and those who came up to the microphone to um, speak of their calling and changes that they've had to make along the way, awesome. Uh, and you can't find that many words to describe it. Folks were speaking freely from their heart and um, it, it brought tears to the eyes of a few of us as well. So it was a wonderful, wonderful evening last evening. And um, I would say you all should clap, cheer yourselves Congratulations. <laughs> the decisions we make in life, especially when it comes to uh, changing our lives around and our lifestyle in service to Almighty God, is always a wonderful experience. Okay. So Brother Mark just reminded me that our, our brothers and sisters in Mississippi and in Louisiana, that's the area with the bad, bad weather happening uh, now, right. So 
we will certainly be praying for them when we uh, do our prayers uh, following services. And again, if you know of anyone here within your family, friends, do let us know so that we can um, include them in our prayer service after uh, uh, um, our main uh, service today. That said and done, I want to turn things back over to uh, my dear brother, Taron, so he can continue on. Thank you, Deacon Carnegie. Please stand while we'll go through our scripture reading. Our scripture reading today is taken from Philippians 3, reading from verse 1 to 9. Philippians 3, reading from verse 1 to verse 9. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evildoers, beware of concision, for we are the circumcision which God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he whereof he might trust in the flesh, I mourn. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ? Verse 8. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Verse 9 and ending, And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Amen. At this time, we'll have our opening prayer by Brother Mike. Brother Mike will come forward with his opening prayer. Please remain standing. Great God, we stand before you here as a, as a group that's not just enjoying the time and the beautiful physical surroundings that you've blessed each one of us with here in the valley. But in this short time, I've met so many beautiful souls here at this feast site that you're working with and trying to individually make each one of us the, the best person, the best Christian we can be, standing before you and doing everything we can to understand how important rejoicing is in this time because of what it tells us, because of what it teaches us individually, collectively, how much, how much we long for things to change from the ways that they are now, the things we're surrounded with. We try to live in our envelope, uh, surrounded by the people that we know and understand and have been blessed to understand, not through any great knowledge of our own, but only because of what you've honored us with allowing us to understand. We want to come before you here and continue to grab the messages that you're putting in front of us that each message touches each one of us differently and that we contemplate on them and contemplate the relationships, not just with each other, but with you, that every moment is one step closer to being with you. We thank you in your son's name for all of these things and every blessing that we enjoy as we live this spectacular life. In your son's name, Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Please remain standing. If we're paying attention to Brother Mike's prayer, you'd have heard his last line. His last line said, give thanks for all the blessing, right? At this time, we're going to do our hymns. And you have to remember, each of our senses, our voice is a blessing. So please follow along on the screen singing these hymns because indeed our voice is a blessing. Let's give all the blessing.
Brother Mark, him 20, standing on the promises. Him 20, standing on the promises. songs are beautiful, Virgin. They are beautiful. Just listen to the words and rock along. Our second hymn is hymn 126, In My Heart There Rings a Melody. Hymn 126, I see Brother Carnegie smiling around there. <laughs> In My Heart There Rings a Melody. Can you guys imagine the time when this song first came out? You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, now we have hit songs. Imagine back in the days when this ju song just came out. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to picture up here, you know, ringing my melody. <laughs> um, at this time, we'll have our praise and worship by the praise and worship team. Praise and worship. Please remain standing. Happy feast, everyone.
And as per usual, we start off with our little Caribbean flavor and then we take it down. Some, <laughs> some praise songs.
you give life you are love you bring light to the darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken great are you Lord it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour Thank you, Sister Celia and the praise team. Um, you may be seated. <laughs> you want to say something? Say amen. <laughs> All right. Um, at this time, we're going to have a special item from the Baltimore congregation. Brother Mark is going to play an audio for us. And we're going to have another special item before our message. So, Brother Mark, 
special item from the Baltimore congregation. Are you hurting and broken in this? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling.
thank you in the Baltimore congregation. Um, this time, we're going to have uh, another special item. Sister Celia is going to bring us a special item. Happy Feast, everyone. Happy um, Feast. You know, the Feast of Tabernacles is a time when everyone is supposed to rejoicing. Um, but each year, as the fall feast approaches, it's kind of a bittersweet for me because it's around the time that I lost my mom. And this year was three years. And for this year, especially, it was a little challenging because being a first-time mom, I really, I really miss my mom this year. It seemed like it was a lost all over again. And this song was kind of a team song when I lost my mom. So during the time when I had the baby and the challenge that arise with it, being a new mom, the sleepless night for the couple weeks or a couple months, this song that I'm about to sing is one that kind of kept me with, along with fasting and praying. So my voice may not be there because I've been singing throughout the feast, but the words is what really kept me. They say sometimes you win some. Sometimes you lose some And right now Right now I'm losing bad Stood on this stage Night after night Reminding the broken It will be alright Right now
See you brought tears to a couple of people's eyes, um, mine included. Thank you, Sister Celia. Um, the reason why we have all these praises going is because we only have one message today. But nevertheless, a song, a testimony, a poem can also be a message, right? So please receive them with open hearts. At this time, we're going to have a young man, <laughs> Brother Andy, a young man coming up with his sermon. I hope you may... Open your hearts, listen closely. You guys have been set in the mood, you know. You've been set from the Bible verse going all the way down. You've been set. So, Mr. Andy, please come forward with your message. Thank you. I hope that my online audience is not castigating me because I've run out of razor blades. But I'm not the only one who has run out of razor blades. Uh, we have Brother John Rasputin Carnegie, and we have Pastor Bill Rasputin Watson. So I'm not the only, uh, the only Rasputin who, who has run out of razor blades. But remember that you, you've had bald heads who, who have come up to make presentations also. We, are, had, we have had one on Monday. We had, we had two before. We had one before, two days before. So. Uh, the message is the important thing. But it's, it's strange how the messages have been so connected. So connected. And the, the fervor, the power, the power of the spirit that had gone before, especially on Monday, when we saw a man who had the, the fire uh, shot up in his bones. Uh, that, was, that was Monday. You know, the pastors aside, because they're number one. They're number one. I, I'm not comparing them with us. But the, the man of fire, fired up on, 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 uh, on Monday. And uh, we were, some of us were, 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 were on heat because he really put it on. You know, I'm, I'm not the preacher type. I'm not. There are many different gifts of the Spirit. You have the gifts of the Spirit, and you have the fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, or segments of the fruit of the Spirit. You can call it fruits of the Spirit. Now, the fruit of the Spirit has to do with our internal qualities to build us up. Each is an individual thing. And the gifts of the Spirit are different. The gifts of the Spirit are for the common good for the, the church community, for the body of the church, all for the common good. So when we speak of the, 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 the fruit or fruits of the spirit, we speak about ourselves having those, nat those, those spiritual qualities, natural qualities uh, to, to, that people can, you know, can, can relate, that we can have to relate to people and people relate to us. So today, believe it or not, I'm going to talk about the transfiguration, another perspective. And we are going to go, because we heard it before, we heard it on Monday, but this is another perspective. But we are going to start at Matthew. We're going to go to look at the perspective of Matthew today. And we'll go at Matthew 16, down to the last part of Matthew 16. And I read, I'm reading for my Jerusalem Bible, Matthew 16. 
And I read that in order to go down to Matthew 17. I'm reading it at verse 27 of Matthew 16. For, and this, this is Jesus speaking. This is Jesus speaking. I think he was on the Mount of Olives at this time. Because when he, 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 was, when he was transfigured, he was, uh, it was six days later. So I'm going there. For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels. And when he does, he will reward each one according to his behavior. I tell you solemnly, there are some of these standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming with his kingdom. Another um, Bible says, with great power and glory. But here it is now. Six days later, this is uh, uh, Matthew 17, verse 1. Jesus took with him Peter, James, and his brother John, and led them up a high mountain where they could be alone. There, in their presence, he was transfigured. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light. Suddenly, Moses and Elijah appeared to them. Appeared to them. They were talking with him. Then Peter spoke to Jesus. Lord, he said, it is wonderful for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He was still speaking when suddenly a bright cloud covered them with, with shadow. And from the cloud, there came a voice which said, this is my son, the beloved, or beloved. He enjoys my favor. Listen to him. When they heard this, the disciples fell on their faces, overcome with fear. But Jesus came up and touched them. Stand up, he said. Do not be afraid. And when they raised up, when they raised their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus. The story is found in all three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In Mark 9 and in Luke 9, here in, and, in Matthew, and here in Matthew 17, in all three of the synoptic gospels placed chronologically are Peter's confession on the one hand and Jesus' passion prediction on the other. On the one hand, Peter is processing that Jesus is the Christ, professing rather that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. This is somewhat a climax. On the other hand, there's a sort of counterpoint in Jesus' Jesus's response to Peter because he uses Peter's profession of faith as the occasion for announcing his own upcoming passion. As we, 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 we saw in, in Matthew 16. From that time, he has been telling his disciples that he must first go to Jerusalem. Second, that he must suffer. And third, that he should die. Or, or be killed. Right? He just don't just die naturally. He's going to be killed. That was too much for Peter. So Peter pulled him one side and said, God forbid, Lord, this would never happen to you. So what did, Peter, what did Jesus said? But little did Peter understand the things from a, a, divine, a divine outlook. Jesus responds, or responded, with a firm rebuke of fraternal correction. He turned and said to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan, for you are hindrance, a hindrance or a scandal, or a stumbling block to me. You're not on the side of God. That's what he said to Peter. And if I were there, and Jesus said that to me, maybe I would walk away. Maybe I'd go, or maybe go sit at, at a corner, and maybe follow him, not with the, 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 the zeal, 
that I would have, I, I, I would have had before. But Peter seemed not to have been hurt. So it is in all three of the synoptic gospels. It comes after Peter's profession of faith. It also comes immediately after Peter's rebuke and the passion, the passion prediction by Jesus Christ that he was going to die. But Peter didn't want to hear that. And then we find something here that Jesus gives us. At the end of Matthew 16, as we read, it seems that to be, seems that to be an interlude. But it is not, not an interlude. Jesus said to the disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. What did he mean by that? The crucifixion hadn't happened yet. These words don't seem to be all that meaningful because they didn't hear him describe the manner of his death. But Jesus is here planting a seed. For whom? For the disciples and for all of us who are following him. Because in a certain sense, Jesus accommodates himself to their weaknesses and ours. Because we're in the flesh. They were also in the flesh. The flesh itself is weak. Because if we knew the future, we would probably, this is a key statement, listen to it keenly. If we knew the future, it would probably be plunged into despair. We would probably, probably be plunged into despair. And so Jesus gives us just enough truth and grace to take us to the next step. That's how Jesus uh, uh, had, had spoken to them. Because they didn't understand certain things. The things, some of the things that we understand, some of the things, I wouldn't say all the things, that we understand today, the disciples never understood. Because when he, remember when he spoke of his death and burial and resurrection? And resurrection. And resurrection. And Peter didn't believe. They just couldn't understand. Just like when he spoke and the disciples uh, and the, 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 the Jews couldn't understand. And they asked. And they asked, um, why are you speaking parables? And he said, to them it is not given to understand. To them it is not given to understand. But to you, my disciples, it is given to understand these things, the things that I have told you. So, as we see, Jesus just gives us enough truth and grace to take us to the next step. And so it is today. But one of the things I, I wondered about the, 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 the sermons that went before, the connection to the sermons. And God is con has connected all the sermons to the feast. I have a notion, I have a feeling that because the one world, the, 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 the Satanists, they are Satanists, because Satan uses his men to plan for this one, one world government. They are hastening it up. Jesus, our Father through Jesus, is hastening it up with us. That we must speak in a way to bring those who he, whom he has called into the fold right now. Because we have a lot of work to do. But he continues and says, For whoever will take his life, whoever will save his life, shall lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will have it. For what will it profit a man to lose his own soul? To, to, to gain the whole world and lose his own soul. What would it profit him? What shall a man give in return for his life? This is a mystery. This is a mystery 
like a seed in the ground that takes a lot of time and faith and patience to really understand. That's how the word of God is. It's not easy to understand. You have to God, have God's spirit with you to understand certain things. And we can't go sola scriptura with everything. We have to go into tradition. We have to go to the scholars. We have to do research. And then biblical research. You know, the, the history of the church from way back, how the, 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 the Jews, the, the, the Israelites, I prefer to say Israelites, how the Israelites used to live and things they did, the cultural things they did, uh, and so on, to understand some of the meanings of the scriptures. So when Jesus is speaking, he's giving us what? The law of love. From the be very beginning, it has been the law of love. Love is the foundation of all things. This was there in the beginning from the book of Genesis. Everything from, uh, from, from, from Exodus to Revelation points back to Genesis. But not many of us can see it. You have to have God's spirit, you know, to see, to see these things. But it's not going to be unveiled. It's not going to be made manifest until Jesus, at long last, fulfills the promises and the prophecies that constitute the Old Testament. No, we have to look at the, the Old Testament. Remember what the Old Testament is? It's the New Testament hidden, concealed. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. And the New Testament is old, revealed. So all that we see in the New Testament were written from the Old Testament, revealed, revelation. And so, this is going to show us how, for the first time, Jesus is going to Jerusalem, where he's arrested, tried, and killed, executed. Peter couldn't take that. Not only Peter, the disciples couldn't take that. But Peter, you know, always garrulous, always ready to, to talk. And, uh, he had a great spirit, Peter. He's not going to die by losing his life. Huh. What am I saying? He's going to die by laying down his life. He agreed to do that with his father. He's laying down his life. No man takes my life away from me. I laid down my life. Willingly. For whom? For all of us. Why? Because his life is a gift of love. A love from the beginning. What love? What manner of man is this? What manner of love is this? That's the love we are called to. Life-giving love. Of course it's life-giving love. Because he died that we might live. That will empower us to do the same thing and to find life in order that we find the origin and source of the life-giving love. How? Through the power of what? The Holy Spirit. We have to have the Holy Spirit. We have to get the gift of the Holy Spirit. Or we can't enter that kingdom. We have to keep the commandments and the feast days. But God is such a merciful God that those who have God in their hearts and do not observe the feast days because they think it's an Old Testament thing. We, 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 we can show them that it's not. I, I won't just go there now, right? When he returns, he, he, he's a God of mercy. He's not going to destroy them. He's going to say, all right, come, go, go up to Jerusalem. And once they open, they will believe, you know, because the, the, hearts, and, the hearts and minds of everyone will be opened. The understanding of, of the true and living God and only one God will be made available to each and every one. To every religion of the thousands and thousands of religions all over the world, they will understand there's only, there is only one true religion. We call it Christianity today. Yes, but Christianity, it, it's so strange that Christianity, has, it, it, you know, is it, like it, it in itself is a, a multiple of, of religions. There's so many denominations, maybe about 60,000 or so. 
life-giving love through the power of his spirit. This is setting the stage for the next preliminary item. And that is where Jesus says something that has baffled readers for many years. You see, it's not just sola scriptura this. I had to do other research. We must do that. He says, truly, truly, I say to you that there are some standing here that will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom with power and great glory. That really sounds like the second coming. It does sound that way. Because everybody's looking forward to the second coming. Some of, some of us naturally assume that what Jesus is saying here goes far into the future after the passion, death, and resurrection. Just but wait a bit. The nature of the Son of Man coming in his kingdom is not showing the last day event. And, you know, which is called in Greek the eschaton. Uh, you, you talk about eschatology, uh, eschatology uh, which means last day event. So this is not talking about eschaton. We know that because he says that there are some standing here that will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. The son of man coming in his kingdom. Many scholars and even the disciples then misunderstood the statement. Because, you know, they were asking, uh, you know, is he going to take over from, 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 from the Gentiles now? The Gentile Romans? Is he going to take over from them now? And then we have the kingdom? Because they were looking forward to that. But if, they, if he had taken it over at that time, where would you and I be? We would not be here. But he had a plan. And he has to bring in all the people whom he, 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 he had earmarked from before the foundation of the world. Many thought that it had to do with the second coming at the end of time. They were thinking at thinking of the, the parousia. The parousia is his coming in Greek. His coming with his presence. His coming, but more so his presence, right, when he comes. That's what some of them were thinking about. But what, 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 what did that mean? Jesus had just unveiled the mystery of the kingdom in terms of life-giving love, in the context of predicting his own passion, then we're sure he wasn't wrong at all because we saw uh, the, the transfiguration. We know that the apostles weren't wrong in following Jesus. Neither are we. We are not wrong in following Jesus. Jesus was talking of something other than the cataclysmic end of time. And uh, I said earlier, it's the eschaton. It was not that. Some of the scholars and theologians were off in understanding what Jesus was talking about. Listen to this. There were some standing there, three of them to be exact, who were about to see the Son of Man coming into his kingdom because the glory of the transfiguration meant what? This is a key statement now, a key answer here. The precise meaning of the sacred mystery of the kingdom of God. Brothers and sisters, we are going to be transfigured if we endure to the end. Transfiguration was not only for Jesus. It's for all of us if we endure to the end. Why has God created us? To glorify us. Not just to worship him, but in order to be glorified. We must worship him in spirit and in truth. Because what is truth? The word of God is truth. That word is truth. But it's a little bit more than that. Truth is the revealed word of God unto the church. We have been hearing this from the first day. The revealed word of God. And we are continuing it. Continuing it. 
and in two days' time, we'll be having some more of it. The father is saying, this is my beloved son, my beloved son, as the cloud overshadows them all. The term overshadows is a rare term. We heard some of it on Monday. It's used in Luke 1, where the power of the Most High will come upon you. The Spirit of God will come upon you. The power of God will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. This was the word used to describe the glorious Spirit overshadowing the Ark of the Covenant. The covering. It's a covering, covered by the Spirit. Kippur, a covering. So when you have Yom, Yom Kippur, it's a covering. Jesus' blood was shed for us as a covering for our sins. And from, from the dangers that are around, we are being covered. Thank God for that. Mary also was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit. She was conceived by the Holy Spirit. She was also overshadowed. She was covered. The cloud and the voice were the presence of God. What cloud are you talking about? The cloud in the, in, 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 in the wilderness. Yes. It was a covering, an overshadowing. This doesn't happen again until when? The baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist. The covering, the overshadowing. That was a private re revelation to John the Baptist because John was the one who heard the voice of the Father as he was baptizing the Son and discovering that he was what? Why did he baptize the son? He baptized the son with water. And the son is going to baptize his people with what? The Holy Spirit. The dual baptism we're up to. The Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God, in this sense, was not a place, but the presence of Jesus. Yes, it was the presence of Jesus on the mountain. The Son of Man, the Son of God, coming in his kingdom. This is the prerogative. This is the privilege given uniquely to Peter, James, and John, precisely by witnessing this glorious transformation. And it is known as the, the transfiguration. It was a transfiguration. That is the key word. Transfiguration. Because we too are going to be transfigured. No bones about it. We are going to be transfigured if we endure to the end. The revelation to the disciples is a manifestation of the truth and the power and the beauty and the reality of the kingdom of God, as you heard described on Monday by the fireman. And so this is the provisional fulfillment of Jesus' pledge that there were some standing there that would not taste death before they saw the Son of Man coming in his kingdom with power and great glory. Another thing that should, we should notice is that this accord on a high mountain. Okay. You're touching something else now. On a high mountain. Why? What is the meaning of mountain in Bible prophecy? Kingdom. So look at this. This is a pattern that we can trace throughout the Old Testament. It is always on a high mountain that God ratifies the covenant and, do, and does what? Renews it on a high mountain. You see the things that come out of the transfiguration? And I'm sure that 
if anyone else comes and deals with this transfiguration, you'll hear different things that you heard, you have been hearing, and hearing now. A mountain, yes, in the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden was in a mountain. So God is always meeting his people in a mountain. Significant. Symbolic. There's also Mount Ararat in Turkey. Today's Turkey. Where Noah's Ark rested and where the covenant was renewed. Noah's after, after Adam. Was, Adam first got it. Then it was renewed with Noah. And so on and so forth. There is Mount Moriah with Abraham. It was also renewed with Abraham. There's Mount Sinai with Moses. Covenant renewed with Moses. There is Mount Zion with whom? The king himself, King David. And there is Mount Sinai with Moses. We said that earlier. But yes, Mount Sinai with Moses. There is Mount Zion with David. Oh, and back to Mount Sinai. And we also see the name Horeb. We just say Mount Sinai. With whom? With Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 19. Look there at, uh, with Elijah. And we are going to tell you why is it that Moses and Elijah were seen and nobody else with Jesus is here. We're going to give it to you. We have to do research. We have to do research. You can't go sola scriptura and understand everything. And no wonder then, who would appear but Moses and Elijah, men who were familiar with meeting up with the Lord God in his glory on a high mountain. And remember the Lord God that they used to meet up on, you know, was Jesus, you know. Jesus was the God of the Old Testament. The only thing took on that name when he came in the flesh. Men who also represent the law and the prophets, both, both pointing to the coming of the Messiah. Pointing to the coming of the Messiah. Moses gave the law. Elijah was the greatest prophet. And the only two men in the Old Testament who, f listen, here's the reason, who fasted for 40 days and 40 nights like the Lord. The only two men in the New Testament who fasted 40 days and 40 nights like the Lord and not only survived and lived to tell, it, tell about it, but bore witness to Christ who would come and fast and pray and manifest the glory of the kingdom precisely in these terms. On the, 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 on the mountain. Yeah, I'm coming down with, the, you know, with, the, with, with what... Um, some, some scholars speculate, you know, was the mountain. We're coming down to that, right? So this is not a geographical accident that this is occurring on a high mountain. It is also not an accident that the mountain is not identified. They didn't name it, but some scholars speculate. We're coming down to that. Scholars speculate, and here it is, that it's either Mount Tabor or Mount Hermon. They are, not, they are not sure. Neither are we. It could be one of the two. And they call it, uh, you know, scholars call it, call it the Mount of Transfiguration. The specific name of the mountain is not important. Not important. The fact that it is a high mountain where the glory of God was revealed Where suddenly Moses and Elijah appeared is important. This shows us not only the continuity as we moved from the law through the prophets to the Messiah. That's how we move. Old Testament, the law, the prophets, the Messiah, New Testament. The only three who in, 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 in scripture among them who fasted 40 days and 40 nights. 
for today's forty nights. But it also shows how the climax of salvation history is being unveiled to these three apostles, Peter, James, and John, through their testimony that is subsequently given to all of us. We have that to look at and to learn from. There, there, there's more concerning the, the, the mountain. There's more. But the transfiguration itself is something that is really significant. Why? Because, on the one hand, we might be tempted to say, well, the Father recognizes that now. That now that the Son has not only predicted his own passion and death, but pledged himself publicly to perform this, it would be fitting to, provi to provide his Son with some powerful consolation. This was more than a consolation. It was a revelation. A revelation of how, how we're going to be and what the kingdom is going to be. How we're going to be the kingdom. That's why, you know, they, they, that's why you won't have the Ark of the Covenant. Christ replaced it. You won't have the physical temple. Christ replaced it. Because when he had told the people, destroy this temple and I, I, I raised up in three days, nobody understood. When he was killed, they thought that it was just another murder. He and the disciples thought it was, was just another murder. And when he, when he disguised himself, walking on the road to Emmaus, on the Emmaus road, they didn't know who it was. And uh, when he started telling them the prophecies on the Emmaus road, their hearts burned within them. Because they said it. After he broke the bread, and they, they saw him, he revealed himself. That's why they recognized him then. And then he disappeared. They left the food. Hunger and thirst after righteousness. They left the food, the bread and wine. They didn't eat any. They walked back seven miles to tell the others. Well, what's the significance of seven? We have so many sevens. What's the significance of seven? Not completeness. Can be complete, yes. Can be used that way. It's not necessarily completeness. It's covenant. Covenant. The same word for seven. The same word as covenant, as, as covenant in Hebrew. Yeah. Berith. So he covenanted with them, and he has covenanted with us. When you go in the water, when you go in baptism, it's a covenant you make, you make with God. A vow. It's a marriage. When you're married, it's a covenant, a vow. This word is glorious. We're just scratching the surface. Moses gave the law. Elijah was the greatest prophet in the old, uh, and uh, the, the, the only two men in the Old Testament who fasted for 40 days. Learn that. We are reminded of that. And here's a paradox. This was a manifestation of the Son who, in a certain sense, lived a life that is hidden as a servant. He was in the flesh. He was disguised as the Son of God. And so, at one level, we are tempted to say that the sacred Humanity of Jesus is like a veil that conceals his divinity. The flesh was a veil to conceal his divinity. The only divine human that walked the earth. The only divine human. They have some Bibles that they print and they have in it John the Divine. 
channel is never divine. Jesus was the only, only person divine. That must be crossed out of the, the Bible. And this is most certainly true. I'm telling you, let me repeat it. And so at one level, we're tempted to say that the sacred humanity of Jesus is like a veil that conceals his divinity. And this is most certainly true. It concealed his divinity. His flesh concealed his divinity. But remember, he said in, 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 in the high priestly prayer, it's known as the high priestly prayer, prayer John 17. Here he said, glorify me with the glory that I had before. He came out with that glory, you know. When he was, when he was, uh, um, when he was resurrected, he, is, he came out with that glory, you know. But he went back for, for the, what, what do you call it? it it's faster. Give me a word. Do it to his father. The, the, not, ver not verification. But, what, what brother? Oh, yes. He went up as a wave sheep, wave sheep offering. Right. I agree with that, right? Good. But at another level, and even deeper level, if the divinity of Christ is being unveiled, it's not simply being unveiled. In terms of the spectacle of his luminous glory that is bright as the sun, that is so wonderful, but even more, the spectacular glory of God's kingdom that is manifested in the pledge of Jesus' passion, his death, and his resurrection for us if we endure to the end. And we must encourage one another. We must pray for one another so that we, we, we endure to the end and be saved. Because that is the stuff of which God's kingdom consists. That is the means by which we enter into his kingdom. That pledge is going to be confirmed by the Transfiguration. We, are, we have to be transfigured to enter the kingdom of God. That's why there'll be no need for the Ark of the Covenant. There'll be no need for the temple because God will be the temple and our bodies will be the temple. will be shining greater than the sun. In the city, there'll be no sunlight. There'll be no moonlight. For God himself is the light. And those who will become his sons and daughters, it will be only sons, there will be neither male nor female, will shine just like him, just like the father, and just like the son. And we can go to him any time we want. In the, the, the physical tem temple, the high priest had to go into the Holy of Holies, and they had to tie a rope around his foot, just in case he, doesn't come, he can't come out. Because in the presence of God, the presence of God is like consuming fire. And this is not just another martyr or martyrdom. Not just another martyrdom. As the apostles reveal, this is the manifestation of the eternal mystery of divine supremacy that what is supreme in God is not reducible to the fact that he's a creator and can dominate the entire creation. God can do all things. He can do everything. The supremacy of God is a supremacy that is eternal. It doesn't depend upon creatures to dominate. He uses creatures because he's using us today to counter the, the attacks of the devil. The supremacy of God is, pre is precisely the glory of the love between Father and Son empowered by their Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not a person. The Holy Spirit is the power of God. Most of Christendom teach that the Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is the person, the in person, uh, in, uh, as a being, is God, the Father, and his Son. Of course, you have lower uh, angels or Holy Spirits also. But the, the, the Holy Spirit that is being given to us, of which I, 
uh, a deposit is given to us. It's the power of God. That's what the, the apostles say. My sister, if you are listening back in Jamaica, this is correct. Call me up on it today. My beautiful sister, she's so very beautiful. Peaches. All my sisters are beautiful. I have seven of them. There were eight and one died. Right? Yeah. We need to go into, into these things. He is going to convey this to us precisely by allowing us to receive him his, and his resurrected body. He's, to, he's going to allow us to receive him and receive his resurrected body. It is the, the resurrected, glorified, ascended, enthroned humanity of Christ that we will receive. Same thing like Jesus. Just like Jesus is. The body that he has is the body that we receive. What Luke 9, 20 tells us is a detail that Luke alone includes. That Jesus went up on a high mountain to pray. Now, this is one of the things uh, you know, that Jesus uses the mountains for, to pray. Jesus is showing us that the power of prayer is the source of the Christian's life, not just the church in a collective uh, sense. But every member individually, personally, and privately for us. Power, prayer, the power of prayer. Luke speaks more about the prayer life of Jesus than the, the other uh, gospels combined. Luke, let me go to Luke 9. Matthew, um, Mark and Luke, Mark, Mark 9 and Luke 9. And uh, you, you see all that. So he's going up there for the purpose of prayer. Jesus went up to the mountain for the purpose of prayer. The glory of the transfiguration is a visible sign of the invisible reality of Jesus' prayer life in general. Yeah, the glory of the transfiguration shows his prayer life in general. But more specifically, the communion that his prayer life expresses, the communion of the Father and the Son, communion of Father to Son, the prayer life of Jesus, the communion be between himself and his Father, and that is what he's pulling us into. Everything that Jesus says and does is the outgrowth of prayer. Outgrowth of prayer, outgrowth of prayer. Every part of his adult life, every part of his entire human experience is a prayer which is an ongoing conversation, not just with God, the creator, but with whom? Abba, Father. What did he say to the disciples in Matthew 6? When you pray, say what? Father! Yes. And for a specific reason, Abba Father, who has sent his Son for the purpose of giving, giving us the Holy Spirit, so that we might be drawn into the glory of his kingdom and given resurrected bodies, transfigured bodies, just like his. Go back to Genesis. What did he say? What did they say? Let us make man into our own image and likeness. That is what we'll, we'll be getting. He created us to glorify us. And it was a glorified, an evidence of the glorified body of Christ and the glorified kingdom that Peter, James, and John saw. He doesn't get anything out of the entire proposition of the incarnation, his passion, and his resurrection. God doesn't get anything out of it. We are the ones who get. We are the ones who get everything out of it. And we are go going to get everything out of it if we endure to the end. Because Jesus used the term, that's how I use, I use often. If we endure to the end. Whoever endures to the end will be saved. We have to endure to the end. Bear the cross. Bear the sufferings. We have to bear it. 
Why did he go through all that trouble to, to give it to us? To resurrect our bodies. To transfigure our bodies forever. To draw us into the prayer life here on earth. Into everlasting communion with the Father, the Son, and their Holy Spirit. He wants us to do that. We must do it now. We must do it. Are we trying to the kingdom? It's not a cakewalk. It's a rough, rough environment we're in. Christian environment is a rough environment. Because when Satan hits you one way and you recover, he hits you another way and you recover. He hits you another way. So you're all in, always getting licks. And we must bear the attack. What's the big deal here? That is the eternal kingdom. That is the kingdom of God, which is also the kingdom of heaven. Not going to heaven. The Bible doesn't say that. Our rulership is in heaven. Because heaven is a place where God lives. No man can go there. Flesh and blood can't go there. What should the transfigura transfiguration remind us of? Certainly, the divinity of the Son. Manifested in his humanity, generally, but more spe specifically, his ministry. His ministry. What is a ministry? The ministry is his passion and death and his resurrection. That's what he came for. To suffer, to give up his life, and to be resurrected for us. He came and lived with us. He taught us. He's still teaching us. He suffered for us. He was resurre resurrected for us. He ascended for us. And he's now enthroned at the, at the right hand of his father, pleading for us. Could we want more than that? Could we want more than that? We have gotten everything. We are getting everything. This is not something that just happened to him or to salvage his redemption from, that is, the very purpose of his incarnation. This is the very purpose of God creating the universe. Is the universe we're going to inherit, brothers and sisters. We'll be traveling at the speed of thought. The universe we're going to inherit, not just earth. The kingdom will be on the earth. Or the earth will be the kingdom of God. And calling us to become his sons and daughters, that is today, through Christ, by the Spirit but most especially by means of prayer. The mountains were, were, were very important for prayer. Jesus used to go there often. By addressing God personally, sharing with him our gratitude, by giving to him his well-deserved praise, but also sharing with him our fear and our, our anxieties. Jesus said, do not be afraid for a reason. For he knows that there are not only excuses for us to give into fear, but there are solid reasons to be fearful. But there is one overarching reason. That is the kingdom of God in our midst. He, his representatives are here, you know, it's just that we can't see them. They're right here. Each of us has one, at least one. That's why they can give an account of, of what we do to the, to the Father. Every, every day they go. I think they alternate. One goes up and one stays down. <laughs> yes. The power of God's Son manifested in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus is. This is really and truly who we are called to be. As a family that is extended from the Father through the Son, in the spirit, this is a kingdom like no other. This kingdom of God is like no other. Peter, James, and John saw it. And, and may I ask a question? It was spiritual, wasn't it? Was it real? 
All right, one, one more question. The, 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 these things, the things that are seen, as opposed to the things that are unseen, which is more real? Because these things are perishable. Every material stuff will pass away. Peter says it. Everything will be made new. All things, all these things will be will, will, will pass. So the spiritual world is more real than what we are seeing. Jesus just happens to be our eldest brother. He's our eldest brother. That's a great assurance. And therefore, I go to my father and to your father. That's what he said, you know. Say, so brother, this is the key. That's what he told the disciples. I go to my father and to your father. And he does that not to distance himself from us, but to shake, oh, sorry, to stake his sacred, glorified humanity into the glory that he had before that he asked his fa father for, for in John 7, John, John um, 17. So that all that has been true of God from eternity is now for the first time true for us in our humanity because the son has assumed our humanity to impart that to us, to make us what? Not just forgiven sinners, not just pardoned and acquitted criminals, because sin is a crime. Not just patients who have undergone healing, sin is sickness, but prodigal sons and daughters who have been reconciled, reborn, rebirthed. We have truly been adopted, raised up by the Father, through the Son, in the, spir the Spirit, to be transformed from sinners to saints. So, the concluding fact of all this is simply this. That is, God is our Father, Abba, Father. I go to my Father and to your Father, he told the disciples. And the same thing goes for us. He's given us fathers. Listen to the contrast or similarity. So the human fathers, I am one. So that we can come to know him for who he truly is. He gives us fathers who have faults, who have failures, who have flaws. And so they are, I should say, we are, and those are signs that point beyond themselves. Yeah, well, or being fathers, you know, it's just a sign. And he points us to the, the only true father. That's one. Two, the eternal father. Three, the perfect father. Four, the loving father. Five, God, the father almighty. That's who he points us to. We have freedom and power to sin, but his freedom and love and power to save us, to make us holy, immeasurably greater than our feeble power in misuse of freedom to sin and to distance ourselves from it. We have the, we have, we, we, we have the choice. We have the choice to distance ourselves from God. So let us join with Peter, James, and John in entering this kingdom. So don't fault Peter in saying, let's build three uh, tabernacles. Well, what do you see about the tabernacles? Connected to this piece of, piece of tabernacles. What Peter said, connected, yes. The piece of tabernacles, you heard that on Monday. Yes, one for Jesus, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Peter was uh, ecstatic. He couldn't believe himself. Himself, couldn't believe himself. Yes. 
He couldn't believe himself. He was overpowered. What God has in store for us, as Paul, quoting Isaiah, says in 1 Corinthians 2, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor had it entered into the heart of man, what God has in store for us. We haven't imagined it. Imagined it. Haven't imagined it. Brothers and sisters, the best is yet to come. And so, this will get us through our cross, our crosses. This will show us how reasonable it is. It's reasonable to lose our lives for his sake in order to find it, to encourage others as God, as good apostles, as, as good apostles. Now we're, we, we, you know, we're being called apostles to do the same thing as the apostles before us did and as Jesus had, had shown them. God loves us more than we love ourselves. And the transfiguration is proof that there is going to be the profession of faith in Christ, the Messiah. There's going to be the prediction of his passion, death and resurrection, that, you know, looking back, of each and every one of us. Yes, we are going to be just like that. J Peter, James, and John saw that's how we're going to be if we endure to the end. And look at this comparison. Remember, our mortality is what? 100%. What about our immortality? 100%. Forever. It's going to be forever. Yes, I'm jumping down. I'm going to leave us on these things. Yes, I've made a point. Made a point. And it's precisely that, that glory that was revealed to us to which we are called. Let us ask our Father to write this on our hearts. Jeremiah 31, 31. I always remember Jeremiah 31, 31. That he, what he says, it's going to write on our hearts. Write the, 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 the commandments on our hearts, not on stones anymore. Yes. To etch the mystery. That's what asked the Father. To etch the mystery of his power and his love. Manifested on the Mount of Transfiguration, as they called it. This brings to mind Jeremiah 31, 31. I always remember it. And we, we, we are at the end. We're at the end here now. God wants to use diamond, figuratively, to etch to carve into our hearts a new covenant, a new law. That's the new covenant that Jeremiah 31, 31 talks about. A new love. We need to love more. Love the word more. Love our brothers and sisters more. Love our pastors more. Love our children more. Love, love our wives more. Love our husbands more. I love my wife dearly. Oh, she's so beautiful. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, she's humbly, you know, she's a gentle giant. Yeah, I'm like a ragamuffin sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man, Jamaican men are rough, man. No Jamaican man inside, he can say, say otherwise. We're rough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So God wants us to use diamond to etch, to carve in our hearts a new covenant, a new law, a new love that is not finite or created or natural, but infinite, uncreated, and eternal. The supernatural grace that is our, our life as children of God forever and ever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Brother Hopeton. Very informative, right? <laughs> Very informative. Um, we learned a lot of words today. Eschatology, 
sola scriptura. <laughs> Brother Upton, theologian. All right, at this time, we're going to have our two final hymns, then our closing prayer. Our two final hymns, then our closing prayer. The first one is hymn 71, I surrender all. Please stand. Hymn 71, I surrender all. Final hymn is hymn 43, Living for Jesus. Brother Mark Ellis will give us our closing prayer and our benediction. Hymn 43, Living for Jesus.
please remain standing. Let us pray. Eternal Father, great God in heaven, Father, once more we bow before your throne of grace to give you thanks. To worship before your throne, O great God of heaven, and to offer our sacrifices of praise and our hearts before you. Father, we are thankful for your providence. We are grateful, Lord, for your tender mercies and your tender care of us and our families and friends. We thank you, Lord, because you are with us. And it doesn't matter what time it is, Father, we know, Lord, that your love is unfailing, that you can be trusted. And Father, we thank you, Lord, for this great hope that you have given us. Father, we did not ask for these things because, Lord, if we were to live eternally in the flesh, if we were to live eternally as base men, as long as we can behold you in absolute terms, Father, we would be eternally satisfied and satiated with your goodness. But, Father, you are the one who promised us all these great things that our minds cannot even fathom, the extent of what you have in store for us. So, Lord, help us, O oh great God of heaven, to live for you, to live for our blessed Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to live overcoming lives so that we will be with you. This is what we desire, O oh great God. Help us to be strong, and to be resilient, yes. and to walk by faith yes. and not by sight. Yes. Knowing, Lord, that, that those things which are spiritual are of greater substance than anything that we can see, because our eyes surely cannot see. We can see only the natural, but there is a greater reality for us to see. And we can only see those things from the visions that you give us. Oh, yes. By you opening our eyes, Father, and opening, opening our hearts. So we pray, Lord, that you will continue to bless us. Bless us here as we come to the sixth day of the feast. Bless our activities. Bless our fellowship, O oh great God of heaven, and keep us united and bonded as brothers and sisters in our Lord Jesus Christ. Unite us as one, because we pray and ask all these things in the mighty and blessed name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his great and awesome peace. You are dismissed. But before you go, Sister Rose has some, some details for today's activities for us. Sister Rose. Hello, everybody. Another day of excitement today. We had a really good time. We're planning to have some good times today. We're going to meet at Moorer Gearing Park. It's on Gearing Way, Fishkill, located on Gearing Way at the intersection of Route 52 and westbound I-84. The directions are on the table there in the corner are printed out on a piece of paper. We're going to meet at 2.30 to 5.30. Go and get some lunch, bring it to the park and we'll all eat together and we're going to play some games and maybe listen to some music. We're going to have a good time. So I hope to see all of you there. Amen. Have a great day.